So when your memory of moving to Dane is in 19 what? 1925. 1925. And, and can you remember anything about how you got here? Not that trip. But now when we moved back in 1930, we came back on a... Uh, the company had trucks to haul coal, haul a little bit of everything on. And my father and mother, they was up in the front with the driver. Two, three kids was on the back of the truck with the, on the back of the truck. If it rained, I don't know where we had to go there. It was open. It was open, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, at long at that time, I'll tell this too. Uh, we stopped somewhere down by Spruce Pine. North Carolina, and as a fella came up and wanted to buy my sister, baby sister, and he wanted to give us a bushel of potatoes for her, and oh, that told me all the pieces. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is 1930. Yeah, this is not in the 1800s. <laughs> right. <sighs> And so. And your baby sister was younger than you. Yeah, yes. And what did your parents say? Well, the quite natural. Oh, wait, you know, I don't know whether the fellow was uh, carried on or just uh, wanted to bring up a conversation or not. But all oh, we wasn't for that. But now, back in those days, if they'd have won the real bad, they would have taken her. <laughs> So that, was that kind of scary? Yeah, kind of like, well, to me, it was kind of scary to me. It's dark and it's raining, the moon gives no light. So stay with me, darling, I know it's all right. Well, sit down beside me, I'll tell you my mind. My mind is to marry you and leave all behind. So put up your horses and feed them some hay. For I cannot marry, my parents both say. My horses are hungry, but they won't eat your hay. So goodbye, my darling, I'll feed on my way. Your parents are against me, they say I'm too poor. They say I'm not worthy to enter your door. So go with me, Molly, we'll drive till we come to some little lone cabin, we'll call it our home. Yes, I will go with you, you're poor, I am told. But it's your love I'm after, not silver or gold. So fare you well, mother, I'm going away. His horses are hungry, but they won't eat your hay. I would read anything that I could find. I always read all the messages on the canned goods cans, turn them sideways, where it would say registered by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. It never said by the Virginia or Illinois or Massachusetts or New York or California. Oh. It was always registered by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Why was that? I do not know the answer to that. I read cereal boxes. You just shoe anything. Were that way. Shoe boxes. And did your mother or your father encourage you or do you just have this memory of always wanting to read just on your own? My mother and dad did not encourage me to read. My mother and dad only had each four years of education, and those four years probably were not 180 school days like it is. They, this was in Georgia, back in around uh, 1897 or 98 or 1900, 1901, two, in that area. Uh, and that would have been typical for that time period. That's typical right? for that time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I had this unending curiosity. On a baseball bat, 
I'd read who made it, what model it was, look on the end to see if there was a number. There wasn't anything that I would not read. So I knew generally from a distant viewpoint what was going on in the world. Now, what about your other siblings? Did they have this great interest in reading, or were you the unusual one? In my opinion, they had a lesser interest in these things than me. So you were just born that way? Yes. uh, uh, There's so many things that could be said. I didn't start to school until I was seven years old. Now, was that the usual age to start, or was that late? I would say it would be one year late. But my older brother, who was two years, two months, and one week older than me, didn't start school till I did. So he was nine when he went to school the first time. And the first year we went to school, I believe, was 1920. And was that in Dant or West Dant? In Dant. In Dant, okay. In Dant. It, do you think your mother just kept you home for some reason without starting him, and you and Owen together? It is easy, it is not easy to answer a question like that without making a long speech. Mm-hmm. When we started school, we lived in the middle upper reaches so of, long of Town Hall. Okay. No paved roads, yeah. no sidewalks. The only way that you could get to school was to come out of Town Hall and walk the railroad tracks. Mm-hmm. Or there was a section of houses occupied only by black people with a road in between. So the choices of walk the railroad tracks with trains coming mm-hmm. and going mm-hmm. close to you. Right. Scary and dangerous. Yes. Or walk down the street between the houses occupied only by black people. And in our ignorance, we were not perfectly compatible with the black people. We probably feared them a little bit because they were different from us, and they probably feared us a little bit because we were different from them. tell me that you know some old Civil War stories. He said your grandpa was in the Civil War. Could you tell me about them? Well, my grandpa Carter was in the Civil War. And uh, he, he was a drummer in the old Civil War. And uh, the old man, Cal Miller, they defied. They went through the whole war and come out of it. And my grandpa Watson, he, he dodged them out through the war. And he dug him a cave back in the ground, and him and the old man George Watson stayed together. And they stayed in there and made scrub room baskets out of splits, and they slipped them out. And got and grandma, my grandma, would take them and sell them. 
for 25 cents a piece for the hay for bushel basket and uh, 25 cents for a scrub brew. That's about all I know about that. Well, uh, <coughs> my grandmother, my grandma Carlin, she was sick, and uh, Grandpa, he was the drummer in the Civil War, you know, and uh, she was sick, and they didn't have very much to eat at that time, and what they called the home guards come in and took every bite they had, and they had about a bushel of corn, and they took and they had punchings down in the floor. It didn't have the floor like we have nowadays. It's made out of punching split, yeah. hewed out of punching. And they took rays up to punchings. They couldn't carry everything, and they poured that corn down through them cracks out on the ground and under the floor. And my grandma sent my great grandpa word that she was sick and they didn't have a bite to eat. And he went over there and took my basket of groceries and. Uh, she was real sick, and my daddy was just a baby, my father was, he was just a little baby, about four months old at that time, and uh, they, so they took her back she had, and he kind of brought them something to eat until she got better, and then I don't know what happened after that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, well, they'd tell me about it, you know, my, yeah. my dad would. You tell her, Don. All right, this is Mr. Henry Hagelin. He lives at Sugar Grove, and he's going to tell us about Uncle Marsh Greer. Experience in the Civil War. In the Civil War at the Battle of Gettysburg. He was in the front line, and he got up almost to the wall, about 30 feet, and was wounded. He rolled back down the hill and lay in a sinkhole while the battle went on. His comrades and people that he knew that was in his company went over the top of the rock wall of Little Round Top, and when the flag barrier was on the wall, he returned around and motioned, come on. And a few minutes after that, he went over the wall, and the battle died there. And Mr. Greer knew that they were killed or captured. Many years afterwards, he went back to a reunion there, and he walked his way as through the valley of wheat and so on like they had it at that time and got to the wall where he thought Hicks went over the wall. And he went over the wall and went about 30 feet from it and there was a little monument. On that monument it stated that here was a high tide of the Confederate drive for the day and the flag barrier and his Captain, both were killed at this spot. Mr. Greer lived many years after this and told me more about it, and I verified it by the fact that I sent my daughter went and found the little monument just like it was, and other folks have done the same thing. And since about all I can think that actually connects with that. My grandmother and grandfather lived about two miles from where I am now at the old home. My grandfather was in the army at the time this happened. Along the state line there were many robbers and lots of them would join up with the Union Army and name and claim to be soldiers it wasn't and there's was nothing but robbers. A bunch of them come to her home one day and took her horse and left an old broke kneed horse is no good. Next morning her and her sister got on this old horse and went to where they had camped at Butler, Tennessee. And she asked to see the commanding officer, Colonel Kirk. And he told him to bring her in, he'd talk to her, and she told him about this horse stealing. And the man said, we're not making war on women and children. And he sent around and found the horse and found the man that stole it and gave the horse back to her and sent four soldiers to see she got back to home all right. He didn't 
have too much faith in the stories you heard about the soldiers. How come that blood all over your hands? Son, come tell to me. It's the blood of the little guinea gay hoe that rode by the side of me, 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 that rode by the side of me. How come that blood all over your hands? Son, come tell to me. It's the blood of Monly Brother. That road by the side of me, 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 that road by the side of me. What did you fall out about, son, come tell to me? We fell out about that little red rose bush that might have made a tree, 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 that might have made a tree. When are you a-coming home, son, come tell to me? I'll be at home when the sun sets in the east, and that will never be, 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 and that will never be. Yeah, any kind of medicine that the old people well, use? Well, you tell that there tale about the, the, the rock and the cow? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Tell and, that. Well, yeah, we yeah. my, we had that myself. my grandmother down here, she, she always... Uh, kept a white flint rock at the, at the milk gap to keep it down when a cow would come brashing over, I'll say bag, <laughs> and there, it swelled and she'd, she'd spit on that and, and rub that cow's bag with it every time she milked for nine days. She said the, that took the swelling out of it. Well, you know, most of the time in nine days, the swelling will leave a cow's bag anyhow. I didn't have much faith in it, but now she thought that it was a present cure for that. And then she had a red rock she kept in the far place. I had an old time chimney. It's in that old house down there yet, the chimney is. And she, over in one corner, she kept a, a red flint rock buried in the ashes. And, you know, and I'd saw it in there several different times after I got up big enough to realize what things is going on like that. And I asked her one day, I said, Come on, what you got that red flint rock in there? She said, That does to keep the chickens, a hawk's catching the chickens. Says that's what they keep it in there for, and she believed in it. Mm. Now, what kind of medicine did they give you when you got sick? Well, they gave me nanny ball tea for the measles, <laughs> and I know it was bad, but I didn't know it what it was when it was taking it. Well, tell us what you took. <laughs> well, I, it was uh, sheep manure, I'd say, is what it was, and they went to the field where the sheep laid, you know, and, and they got these Little little balls, you know. They'd get them where this dry, and they brought them back, and they put them in a the kettle, and they boiled them, and and, and then they strained the <laughs> strained the strain that you know, and they made a tea out of it, and put a little grain of sugar in it, and and you drunk it just as hot as you could drink it, you know, and and that broke the measles out on you, and it worked too. For I drunk it that night to, to give it to me, and next morning I broke out with the measles. I reckon it was a Real good remedy. Well, did they have anything for the mumps back then? They? Or Not chicken that. pox? Or? Next thing, I'll tell you one thing when you have the mumps that you don't want you don't want to do. Have you ever had the mumps? You don't want to take nothing sour in your mouth. If you do, your jaws are locked. <laughs> um, you, know, you, can, uh, you can recollect when uh, your Uncle Monroe's young ones down there had the uh, smallpox. That was the last case of smallpox and the first ones I've ever known to be in this country. Well, me and Alfred went down there for something, and we didn't know what to have the smallpox. And we went in the house, you know, and whatever we went after, I believe we went after, I sat in eggs is what we went at. Well, we'd come back, and, and they told us that they, had, that they had the smallpox in there, but they thought there's well enough of them, you know, that we went, might not take them. Well, we come back, and we told them about it, you know, and well, that just scared me grandma to death, and she went to hunting mullein. Yes, you know what old mullein is, you know. And she made tea out of that old fuzzy stuff, and we drank it for, had to drink it for nine days. And I had to die, my tongue got just as fuzzy as a, just a leaf of that old mullein. I couldn't hardly talk, but <laughs> we never took the smallpox on that. We took it, we drank it nine days. We'd have to drink it that way. Every, every evening we drank a cup of that old mullein tea. And bitter, and Lord, that was the bitter stuff that I ever tried drinking in my life. Uh, what did they give you for spring fever? 
Well, my dad always give me us a hitch. <laughs> <laughs> he always whooped me for in the spring, and he called it the cornfield fever, you know. A man got lazy with the whole corn. I've laid out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Of old sayings and cures. Now, if you want to cure the flu, take a little ragweed tea. When young as are young, they're awful bad to wet the bed. Now, if you want to cure that, they make a tea out of corn silk and hot water, and it'll cure them from wetting the bed. Another old remedy, a rhubarb root, put on a string, put around your neck, will cure belly ache. Tie a big red onion to a bedstead and keep the children that sleep in the bed catch a cold. If your nose itches and somebody's coming and they'll have a big hole in their breeches. If a girl's shoe comes untied and her stocking falls down, she knows her boyfriend's are thinking about it. On a whistling woman and a crowing hen always comes to the devil's den. I always choose a cud, and if she lose a cud, just give make her one of an old dirty rag. The sunshine is red. This means rain. Rain for seven shines for eleven. Mary in red, you wish yourself dead. Mary in black, you wish yourself back. Mary in brown, you live in town. Mary in yellow, you'll be ashamed of your fellow. Mary in green, you'll be ashamed to be seen. Mary in blue, you always be true. Mary in white, you'll always do right. Put your clothes and go into bed, you sure get up with a wet, soggy head. Iron snake, put in a keg of cider, make it keep sweet and keep it from spoiling. I'm going to tell about some fellas down in South Carolina that thought how dumb people was in North Carolina. They was going to make some county vet money. Said they'd make $18 bills and bring them up here in the mountains of North Carolina where the people are sort of dumb and they'd uh, uh, change it for real money. Well, they, they, they made them some $18 bills and drove up here in the mountains of North Carolina and they drove up to an old country store and there's an old feller sitting there, the side of his hat gone, and this one overhaul gallus and the big chew of the biker in his mouth, sitting on a nail keg, and one of them got out. He said, say, mister, said, can you change an $18 bill? He said, I sure can. He said, how do you want it, two nines or three sixes? <laughs> this feller said to his buddy, he said, let's get out of here. He said, they got nines and sixes made up here. I said, there's no use to fool around here. I said, we'll get nothing on them. <laughs> It went up in Virginia, that was the stride of depression to get us a job, you know, and we'd tramp and tramp from one old logging job to another, and everything was just about gone to bad, and couldn't get no work at all. We got us both broke, and we were just a bumming first one house to the other, and wherever we could get a bite to eat. We hadn't done much good at that. We'd got several good cushions along the road and run off, and finally we decided to let him play off like he was blind, you know. And and we'd we'd uh, uh, get something to eat that away. Well, I, I went leading him up to the house and hollered, and he come out a lady, you know, and 
I asked her if we could get something to eat. I had a blind man there, and he got his eyes blowed out in the mines. And I was trying to get him home. She said, yeah, just bring him on in. It, she'd fix us something to eat, you know, and be glad to. I told her, well, he's much trouble to get in and out of the house. I'd just uh, the other way on the outside. Well, she said, you come on in, and I'll fix you something to eat. And said, I'll fix him something, and you can take it back out to her. Well, just about the time I got down, sat down to the table, there was a little girl there about the size of blue eyes is there, a girl of mine, and she she come running through the house. She said, hey, Mommy, said, come here and watch that blind man run. <laughs> the bulldog guy, you know, <laughs> down the path he went. Well, I knowed I'd be killed, and I just shot out at the back door and through the cornfield I went and into the railroad, you know. <laughs> that old bulldog is clipping his heels. <laughs> Never got nothing to eat at that place. <laughs> it was me and my same man, Dan Harmon, over here, and we'd been on the outer tramping around, you know, and we couldn't get nothing to eat. We was broke. And I went up to bum the house. He never would bum nothing to eat now. That was the truth, and you was out with him. You had to do all the bumming. I went up to the house and asked the lady and if she had anything to eat, and she said, no, she didn't, she didn't have nothing to eat. She said, every day there's much as three or four tramps come here. And said, I, ain't, I don't fool with well, she was a setting the sewing into the sewing machine, you know, and, and I went back through the kitchen. I seen a pot of sitting on the stove, you know, and I eased the lid up, and it's pot full of soup. Me, I just carried the pot and all down to the railroad where Dan was at, you know, and we sat down and eat them. And I said, "Now all this lady asked is, is the pot to be brought back." And I said, "You, I went and got it, and I said you can take it back." He said, "Okay." He said, "That's a deal." And he went wagging that pot up through there, you know, and got up to the porch. He hollered, and that lady come out. He said, yeah, there's a pot. There's a big pot of stove wood on the porch, and Lord, here come them six and stove wood, and him just a turning. It's like winding blades are coming out. Now, he's, he's hitting the railroad. I'd done run about half a mile. I knowed he'd kill me when he got there. <laughs> when he overtook me, he said, there ain't another time. And I take a pot back, know where you go. He said, if you can if you get anything, he said, you can bring it to the road, and I'll eat it. But said, I ain't carrying nothing back. So said, you like to call me killed. <laughs> Let me go back to coal mining in Dant. The coal miners were partly what were called hillbillies. People had grown up in the hills, and their grandparents and great-grandparents. That was one segment. Another segment would be white men from the South, like North and South Carolina and Georgia, uh, Alabama, Tennessee. Also, black men from the South would come up. That was one more or two more categories. And then uh, the coal companies, the bigger ones, would go to New York and Philadelphia and Norfolk and meet the immigrants coming off the boats and hire them and bring them to the coal mines. And these would be Italians and Greeks and Hungarians and Polish and maybe some others. So the population was a polyglot grouping. And the schools were the same. So they didn't have individual, well, they had neighborhoods, didn't they, where they tended to live? There was a tendency for the nationals to group together, but this was not complete. Mm -hmm. There was intermingling, mm -hmm. except the blacks and the whites were separate. In housing and schooling, in the, in the mines, there was mixing. Mm -hmm. Not complete mixing, but White men and black men worked together. My dad more than once worked with a black man, mm -hmm. and the black man with my dad. Mm -hmm. And did that work out pretty well under the ground when you were there all facing the same dangers? There was never an incident that I ever knew of, and I was a person with wide open ears and eyes, never knew of an incident in the mines where there was friction between blacks and whites mm -hmm. or whites and Immigrants, mm -hmm. Dant was a wild place just before we got there. They had just built the CCNO Railroad mm -hmm. into there to get the coal. And then they just had completed the railroad to Elkhorn City, Kentucky, where it met up with the CNO Railroad. I believe George L. Carter was very you, responsible you for that. Yes, that. I've read some of those books. Uh -huh. That had just been completed. 
But a lot of the men in the coal mines and working on the railroads were away from home, uh, worked all they could, drank moonshine whiskey, had no entertainment at all, some had no families, so on the Saturday nights it was relatively wild. I'm sure there was some exaggeration, but it used to be said that there was an average of one killing a weekend. It probably was not that bad, but it was bad. But this had sort of settled down by the time we got there in 1960. There still were shootings and knifings and fightings, but on a much lower scale than it had been four or five years earlier. Now we're now up to coming back to Virginia. Yeah, back, and back to back to Dan, Virginia, moved in the tunnel hollow in a three-room straight house, rooms in a row. Mm -hmm. And we went back in the dance school system. And Owen and I, having promoted ourselves in Georgia to the fourth grade, we entered the fourth grade. And we could do the work, had no problem, but the school... out of that car with rifles and high-powered pistols and everything and shotguns and they began and the smoke it just bought and one old fella dressed in overhauls he walked in behind to the end of a gun there and he let in and about the second or third shot he brought one of them down one of these uh thugs you know jeff face from benham killed him a setting boy i'll tell you yeah it was a union man on it too Oh, his name. All right, in a few days here they come to my house. Said, all right. Said, we come here, boy. Said, we got a search warrant for this house here. I said, all right, boy. What do you want? Oh, said, we're hunting for red literature. I said, hell, no red literature here. I said, I'm, I'm a red, but I said, I don't know. I ain't got no literature here. They come in, they searched all around. They found a big batch of homebrew sitting over there, you know. I said, happy sell, boy. I'm just a miner here. They grabbed me by the arm, jerked me all around over the house, said, hell, said, we're not hunting for this year home rule, said, uh, we're hunting for these union men. Well, I said, you found one. I'm a union man right here from the tall bottom of my shoe sole to the last twig on the end of my head. Well, they said, come on, we'll have to arrest you. We'll have to take you down. Well, I said, all right, boys, I'll go with you. I ain't done nothing. I said, oh, yeah, said, you see it going down there with a shotgun, said, on the day of this killing down there. Well, I, that's all right. I said, a man's allowed a shotgun. I said, anyway, I use them to kill rabbits with and squirrels and things. He took me on down to town there, you know, and they walked in there, and that uh, sheriff said, here, said, we've got another red here. And, oh, uh, judge said, that ain't no red. He said, I know that boy. He said, he's born raised here. He said, that ain't no red. He said, I've heard him testify in meetings. Well, he said, we want him put under a big bond, said, and, uh, George, he said, no, he said, I won't put that boy under no bond. He said, I want to talk with him a little. He took me off in a room, and he said, uh, Mr. Donaldson, he said, uh, you, you had nothing to do with that killing, did you? I said, no, sir, I don't reckon I did. He said, what was you going to that shotgun that morning? I said, I'd, I'd start squirrel hunting. Well, he said to these fellas, he said, I can't hold this boy. I said, I've turned him loose. He said, I can't put him under no bond. He said, you yeah, can prove something on him. So that uh, old judge, he turned me loose. You see, I hit him right back up the road, buddy. Hell, nippy de Breno. Headed for the cat race, boy. Yeah, man. I finally looked at that old fence boy where they'd plowed them splinters out there and they'd fell on my neck and down my shirt collar. The sparks from them old shotguns, I'd knock them off, you know, and the wads are laying all around there in the road. And the time boy that ever you see down there. I'm glad it was. But they took all these fellas into the horse pistol, you know. Yeah, yeah. To get the wounds treated. Yeah, yeah. And get them fixed, you know, oh. to, to bury, you know, yeah. in the ground, which that'd be the last of them, you know. Oh, and they go down into that ground, that's the last of them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Never bothered no more. 
Mr. Donaldson, could you tell us something about another strike experience you had? Sure, yes. I've had all the kinds of experience since I was 16 years old. I have upheld the union labor. I've been a friend of my friends and expect to remain that way. I was summoned as a committee to go to Le Follette. Me and uh, Butner Smith. Le Tennessee? Le Follette, Tennessee. I, myself, and Bartner Smith was chosen as a committee to go to help handle the situations of that strike. We went over there. We found 1,150 young girls on a strike. We stretched a large tent through the camp there, and we went to work. Couldn't get any hotel room in the town. The whole city was against us. The officers, police judge, the high sheriff of that county at Jacksburg, Everything was against us. We laid in that tent there for seven days and seven nights and slept on the ground, and finally we got tents, or er, got cots to sleep in. And we liked to froze to death, and we eat uh, dog meat, cheese, and anything we could get. The restaurants wouldn't feed us. Finally, we got a job of boarding up there with a hotel man, and we went up there... One Sunday, we got on a tire, but we got in jail, buddy. Every day, they'd lamb us in jail, and the bond company would come and get us out, and is that away every day, you know, and we'd fight. We'd knock them down with their fists and blackjack them and everything, but they'd lamb us in jail. Finally, one Sunday, we got tired of this old bull, you know. We got out there, and we took our big pistols and got out on the street on Sunday morning, and we'd shoot a few shots and walk a little piece, and directly here come the law from Jacksboro, and a gang of uh, deputy constables and constables, and they grabbed us, you know, and we jobbed them loose and was about to kill them all and run them off out of town, and... We went on up to the hotel, and directly here come the high sheriff with 18 deputies. I was standing out on the back porch upstairs. He said, uh, Mr. Donaldson, he said, come down. He said, I want to see you. I said, here I stand. Just look at me, Mr. Davis. I'm right here. He said, I've got warrants for you and Butler Smith and Bill Smith, he said, and come down and give up. He said, and go on. Bad deal. Yeah, I said, no, I can't do that, boss. I said, sure, you'll have to come up here and get me. Well, he said, tell the other boys to come out. Uh, he said, I don't want to hurt them. Now, I left, and I said, don't you worry about hurting them boys. I said, you worry about getting hurt yourself. I said, they got a hole up here 33 feet long, and them boys in the back end, and the hole's only three foot wide. And I said, you and your bunch out there couldn't get through this hole. You'll all be killed. He got down, he caucused around a little bit, and directly, boy, they looped in them cars, and away they went, back to Jacksboro, you know. And, of course, then there's nothing else for us to do, buddy, only John, uh, the, the, the highball gang, buddy, we come out of Tennessee. Four minutes up. Did you win the strike, Mr. Donaldson? We sure did win this strike, boys, and them girls went to work. And they hollered and marched up that street and hollered her off for Mr. Donaldson and Mr. Smith. They credited us with the whole thing, and we both stand pat today for unionism. With public ownership with profit abolished. And always with. <laughs> was, that a, was that a CIO union, Mr. Donaldson? CIO, I'd tell a man it was, boy. It's a real CIO. Boy, yeah, all good. that money poured in there from every part of the country. We didn't know where to come and do in that bank. Is give us a notice, sir. She went upstairs to make her bed, and not one word to her mother said. Her mother, she went upstairs to Daughter, oh daughter, what troubled you? Mother, oh mother, how can I tell The butcher's boy I love so well He courted me my life away And now with me he will not stay there is a girl in yonder's town where he goes and sits down. 
He takes this strange girl on his knee and tells her what he won't tell me. But her gold will melt and her silver will fly and some day be as poor as I. Her father, he came in from work. Oh, where is daughter? She seems so hurt. He went upstairs to give her hope and found her hanging on a rope. He took his knife and cut her down and in her bosom those lines he found. Go dig my grave, both wide and deep, a marble stone at my head and feet. And on my breast a snow-white dove to show the world I died for love. Uh, This is a story I want to tell uh, about myself along about the year of 19 and 20. I had just at that time uh, run through with about a large sum of money that I'd managed to get a hold of, and you know, a broke man, he wants to ramble. So I decided I'd go out in another state, in the state of Illinois, and I'd try, kind of try life over. That I'd wasted and drunk up a fortune here, and I thought I'd try another state. So I went out there, and I, I soon got employment in the mine. Well, along come the strike. Then the trouble began. There's where my trouble began on me. Uh, the strike come there, and I was soon, uh, I was soon there uh, engaged in a conflict there between capitalist and labor. I was soon there uh, picked upon to a large number of miners in that state. So my idea was for to either stop scabbing or uh, or stop uh, the existence of my friends in that community. So we decided there that we would not permit a mine that was on strike to operate without a a union contract. So one day we had a meeting and about a mile to this mine, and we were selected four committeemen that they might go over there to deal with this coal company. And this committee went, started on their journey, and was shot down by a machine gun man. But I want to say, my friends, as that is one picture that will never get out of my mind. When the news come back to us men that was there in, assembled in meeting, that four of our comrades was dead. Then I want to say to you that men's eyes got as red as far. Murder, hatred, and, and all these things, it looked like, uh, stirred up. Uh, hatred and a malice there that nothing in the world could stop. So we decided there that we'd rob hard- hardwares and uh, get all ammunition and guns and supplies that we needed, and then we'd make a break for our life. So we, just, we carried out this proposition that was made there to us, and the next morning at 6 o'clock we was prepared to make a raid on 65 scab miners and 12 gunmen with machine guns there that they to take our life. But we slipped in. But during the night, uh, I was sent to spy by some, uh, some other men. And over the embankment, I got too close to the embankment. And I rolled over an embankment 25 feet high, which uh, I received a broken arm. Then about the time I hit the bottom, a case of dynamite uh, fell from an airplane that was operated and hit a steam shovel in about, and hit almost, but then finally res- re- revived through the night. And at daylight, broken arm, I crawled out of this pit. And then my friends, the union men, 25 members, at, down at the mouth of this pit, as these scabs throw, and machine guns sewed up their uh, hands of feet, then we found that uh, uh, my men that had sent me was there at my rescue. So they walked them down. I saw him tie the superintendent there to the tree. They said to him, have you got anything to say before you leave this world? He says, I haven't got a thing to say, and more than that, uh, you dirty cowards won't kill a good man like me. And they agreed that he is going to pass out if he didn't talk. 
So he told him he uh, called them all bad names and said that he would not uh, knee or promise anything at all. So they counted three and 31 higher powered bullets went through that man's body at one time. They told the bunch of scabs that stood and watched on, they said, that's what's going to happen to you. They led him down about a mile, and there's a large uh, boundary of woods there, and they said to these scabs, all you fellas that can make it safe through them woods, when we count three without getting killed, you're at liberty. We'll never... So they counted three, and then men began to place their feet. Uh, when they began to count, and when they said three, they started. And out of the 50, 65 men that broke to run, 59 of them was laying on the ground uh, b b near the wire fence. So 15 men was arrested over that, and not one man was ever convicted. We uh, had the protection of some of the good officials of that state and the cooperation with the United Mine Workers, and the public realized that we was in uh, uh, fighting for our rights and our liberty. And they were stood by us in our trials, and there was no conviction in the, in the Herne Mine Massacre. And during this time that these boys was laying shot, I said to one of them, uh, Mr. How come you here? We was lassoed and brought here. Strike no trouble. Uh, will you please get me a drink before I die? I said, sure, I'll get you water. I'll get you water before you die. Turned and asked the man to please give that dying man a drink. He said, I have, I have a family and six children. I don't blame you, but I blame the man that lied to me and got me here and got me killed. He said he took me away from my family. He's the man who stole my life. And I saw the man pass out. I saw another Mexican laying on the ground. And I saw a little delicate woman about the uh, 23 years old with a small child in her arm. And she weighed about eight pounds. And she took the heel of her shoe and she put it in a big bullet hole in that Mexican's breast and turned it around in there till he passed out. You will not starve none of the little child to death, but your doom is over. You go to your place, you old scab you, and tell the devil that I'm down in hell. And I want to say to you, my friends, that there was the high sheriff, the prosecuting attorney, the state militia stood by, and not a man opened his mouth. It, was, it meant death to them. The men was mad. Men there would have killed their mother. Uh, uh, at a word, because four of their comrades had passed, their lives had been stolen, and not a one of these officials opened their mouth. Undertake come up with his ambulance. Have you got any uh, objections to me of taking these scabs? Well, the boy said, no, get them out. And said, all right, you will. He to load the scabs, and the boy said, wait a minute, boy. Don't handle them with your naked hands on you. And he ever won a pair of gloves to handle those scabs with. Several of them uh, passed out on their way uh, while in care of the undertaker. And every one of them men that died, they didn't blame us miners, but they blamed the coal operator that slipped them in there, that promised them lies and persuaded them off from their families. They made this statement that they didn't blame us, and that statement was in the trial. So he had to go on foot. Yeah. So it was kind of a... <laughs> oh, wow. hey, well, Lord, he ain't too far today. Before I got crippled there, I'd take out down this road. Really? I could walk it in about 15 minutes. I'd even really? carry my children and take Gosh. them to the doctor. Huh. And then we got public transportation. No, a bus ran up in oh, here. Oh, really? A bus came up? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, he'd run. That helped a lot. He'd helped a whole lot, but yeah. then they stopped running it. Hmm. So about a lot of people got cars, you see, and mm -hmm. they didn't, wasn't getting much yeah. business. Right, right. But we really need transportation up in here now. Mm -hmm on account of the elder people. Right. Right. Well, now, at what point did you all decide to move to Dan? When my husband got a job at Dan. He got he, a job in the mine. Uh-huh. He and come, he'd never coal mined before, had he? No. He'd been on the farm, but things just looked like they'd be better if you came over here. I wish we'd have never come. Really? I wish my husband would have stayed at at uh, Holston Organs. Oh, is that where he was working? He was working there before he came to Dane. Now, at Holston Ordnance, where was that? Kingsport. That's where my son's working now, okay. Douglas. Huh. So he drove from Baker's Ridge No, down there, he rode you? with a neighbor. Okay. But you, you lived up at Baker's Ridge while he worked in Kingsport? Yes. So that was a long commute. 
Yeah. Yeah. But they was neighbors that was working down there, and he rode with them and paid them, you know. But did he did he get laid off there? Is that why? He no, came my health there? got so bad uh-huh. that he had to miss so much, and uh-huh. so then he come up here and got a job. And I tried to. I didn't want him to come. Really? I didn't want him to come, go in the mines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He got, because you knew it was dangerous. Yeah, he got killed. You know. He got killed in the bump, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. It was six people killed at the same right. time. Right. He was... His birthday was on the 20th of May, 22nd of May. Mm-hmm. And he got killed on the 20th of May of 1948. I was a young widow with four small children. Mm-hmm. I was only 23 years old. Well, do you remember now what exactly he did, his job in the mines? No, I don't. But he was working inside. Yeah. Probably loading coal or something uh-huh. like that. Yeah. Now, I understand in a bump, the, the roof of the mine just falls in. The whole and mountain. crushes everybody that's in there. Did they have? Did he talk before about the sounds that the mine was giving off, the pops and the cracks and everything? Did he mention? That? Only thing that he'd give me any indication that the it was real dangerous it was not too long before he got killed, mm-hmm. and I tried to stop him. Mm-hmm. I, tried, I didn't want him to go back in. Mm-hmm. That uh, he just said to me. You know, if uh, anything happened to him, do not let people beat me out of him. And I know who he told me who he was preparing for, but I would rather mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. put it on record. Mm-hmm. It's my people. Mm-hmm. And they but done. he had a feeling, maybe, I believe he did. that it was unsafe Yes. where he was working. I believe he did. Mm-hmm. See, he got killed two days before his birthday. Mm-hmm. He'd only been... 33 years old. He was 32. Mm -hmm. Well, now, when you were living in Rocky Holler, of course, you were living in a company house. We bought the house. But you bought the house. Oh, you had bought the house. When you moved here, you bought the house. Uh, Well, we lived here quite a while in the company house. And then when Pitson took over, they began selling the houses. And we just went ahead and bought uh, Arnold. Just went ahead and bought the one that we were living in. In Rocky Hollow. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Okay. And that was, what, about 1945, 44? Uh, see, I guess about 46, somewhere along, or 45, 46, somewhere along. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, I finished paying off for the house after he got killed. Mm-hmm. Now, what did... How were you notified that this accident had happened? Do you remember? Did someone from the company come to your house? My brother came. Mm-hmm. Was he in the mine at the same time? Was he Here's working? Wh- he was working. Mm-hmm. Your brother? Carlos Stiffy. Carlos. Mm-hmm. But he should have never told me like he did. Was he real upset? Huh? Was he real upset or... Didn't seem to be, but he told me when he come in, Arnold just got hurt, and he was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And for me to get ready, and he'd run me down there. Mm -hmm. And I went off in the uh, other room to change clothes, and when I got all of my clothes off, he hollered in there, and me there, no woman person or nothing, hollered and said, you might as well get ready and get the kids ready and go over to Mommy so Arnold is dead. Well, I come right near to patient out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If it had been a, felt like a ton on my chest. Mm-hmm. So, so he didn't tell you when he first came in, but he knew. He told me he was in the hospital right. to get ready, and he'd take me down there. Mm-hmm. And it had been better if he'd have waited till I got ready. Mm-hmm. But that's what he hollered in her and said to me. Now, when this happened, which mine was this? Where he they, was? I believe they called it number two. Number two, okay. And when they had an accident like that, would they blow a whistle or anything? I don't you know. Hear, you never don't remember hearing anything. I don't know. 
But there were six men killed all at the uh, same time. Yeah. And they rescued them, brought the bodies out, uh, brought them down to the hospital. Took them to the, I don't know, was in the funeral home. Oh, at the, the funeral home down in, in Dan? St. Paul. Oh, in St. Paul. They took them to St. Paul. Uh-huh. That's where Arnold was there. Uh-huh. I don't know where the others was took. Mm-hmm. And did the company then come to see you afterwards? Did you have any contact with them at all? His boss come. His son got killed. And oh, his, his son and got his killed. son and his uh, wife's brother was killed the same night. Mm. The boss. Who was who was the boss? Do you remember his name? I believe it's Joe Rashman. Mm-hmm. I believe now. I'm not positive. So he came to see you like the next day or the next. He came when or? my husband was at the house. Laid it, you know. They Here at the house. At my home. Uh huh. So I, the, at the funeral home, they would they would prepare the body and then bring him back to your home. I had him brought back. You had him brought back for a week for people to come. Yeah. Uh-huh. So his boss came to see you. Yeah, he talked to him. Uh-huh. And told you how it happened? or Well, he didn't say too much how it happened. He just mm-hmm. come to show his respect. Mm-hmm. And I guess a lot of people came. Yeah, a lot of his people that he worked with. One of his buddies. Don't put this on tape, but one black man come to my gate, and he would come the feather. Mm-hmm. He sent word in. Could he come... And I sent him back word, certainly you can come in. And he came in and stayed quite a while. Well, I wouldn't have turned him. I don't work with him. Well, I wouldn't even want to turn him away. I told him, I said, you're certainly welcome. He came to the door and shook hands with me. I said, you're welcome. And he come on in and stayed a long time. He's a nice person. Yeah, a lot of black people, of course, worked with white people underground, but then when they lived in their communities, they weren't always sure where they could go, I guess. Yeah. You know, in the homes and everything. So so he came to show his respect. Yeah. Do you remember his name? No, I can't remember his name. But he was a nice person, I know that. Mm-hmm. People got along underground pretty well, didn't they? Yes, they did. Yeah. And so then, where was Arnold buried? Temple Hill. Temple Hill. So they had Temple Hill already by then. Yeah. 1948. Lawrence Hill. Yeah, they had it a long, long time Did before they? that. Mm-hmm. Now, as a widow... Did you get compensation afterwards? I'm not saying how much, but did you get... You got well, I something. Don't, I don't care to tell you. Uh-huh. And that's not, not enough for nothing. Because I was devastated. Of course. I didn't know what to do. Sure. So did they come to your home and talk to you and tell you, we'll give you $10,000? Did you get something in the mail? I had to go down to the office. Mm -hmm. That's where I had to go to. Mm -hmm. And did you have to file a claim or something? Well, they just asked questions, you yeah. know. And they knowed he was killed, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so then they wrote you out a check for 10000 Oh, they didn't do that. How did they handle it? They paid to each one of the children so much. So they divided the 10000 up among the children. No, I see. Now, I'm wrong about that. They sent me the little old check. Mm-hmm. I got hit. I guess by the month. Oh, by the month. You would I get believe. so much each month until it was all paid out. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. The Social Security was what had to pay to each child. You know right. what it was? How much? I think each child draw $12.92. A month? Yes. Until they reached eighteen. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so now they got a little raise every once in a while. Right. But that's what it was at the beginning. Right. But I think once the child turned 18. Once the child turned 16, the mo- mother come off of it, oh. uh, the baby one. Uh-huh. When Kenneth uh-huh. becomes 16, right. 
Kenneth was out of a check, and so was I. But then they passed the law that children that were still in school could draw till they was, I believe, 21 or 18. Anyhow, Kenneth got his and back, but I didn't. Hmm. Well. So we had it rough. So you had it rough. Yeah. My how, children. How did you make out after your husband died? How did you get income then? Uh, did you have any income other than the check from the company? I had a house that I had bought when Arnold got killed down at Hamlin. Mm -hmm. And I rented that house. Mm -hmm. I never did move down there. Mm -hmm. After I bought it, I thought I would go, but after I bought it, I decided to stay where I was at. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I rented that house, and the man would pay me. Mm -hmm. And so that, that I had a neighbor that uh, he run the barber shop down here, and uh, he knew that I was honest. Mm -hmm. And when he know if I needed money. See, the man that I rented from would bring it there and leave it mm -hmm. with Mr. Stapleton. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I was short of money, I, I, Mr. Stapleton would tell me that he'd let me have the, ever what the rent was. Mm -hmm. And then he would keep the rent when the man would bring it. And the man brought it. He was prompt with it every month. Every month he was prompt with it. So Mr. Stapleton fixed you a little credit then. Yeah. yeah. He would uh, always let me have the money, and then when they bring the rent money, he would just keep it. Well, so that helped nice me out. That helped me out. Okay. Right. So uh, then I, after my children was all grown and everything, I, some people wanted to buy the house, and I just went ahead and sold it to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And then my cousin lived that and up in Rocky Holler, and I went ahead and sold it to him. And so then, is that when you moved here to this house? That's when I bought this house down here. And so um, what year was that? I come here, I moved down here in 1960. 1960. Mm -hmm. I've lived here ever since. Mm -hmm. Trading up my treasures in that home of love. Trusting fully, trusting in the Savior's love. Doing what I can for heaven's holy dove. I was getting ready to leave this world. I'm ready, ready to leave this world. Have you ever seen a ghost, Papa? Well, I've not actually seen one. I've, I've heard them, but I didn't know what it was, and I never did know it. But uh, they always told me, an old fellow told me one time, he come down on an elk, what they call elk, a trip to, uh, yeah, he was going on down, about Darby or somewhere down there, to buy some cattle, and he, uh, waited for the man to come back that he wanted to see about the cattle, and it got dark. And he was coming back up 
the creek, him and another feller, and said they saw something coming out from the bank of the creek, looked like a sheep. And uh, one of them said to the other, said, shoot it. And he had his gun with him, and he said he shot. And when he shot, he said that goes right, right up on the horse right behind him, and it looked like his eyes was big as saucers and red as a bowl of fire, and his tushes was a, looked like three or four inches long, and said he'd like to cut his breath plumb off and scared the horses, and they run through the brush and like to tore the and put his eyes out, and hit, kept on it like that after until they got across the creek up at the ford where they crossed that. And the horses run through the creek and hit hit that jumped off there. And they went on up to old Uncle Joe Hayes's. And they said they were scared so bad they didn't take time to go in the house, they just fell on the porch. And old Uncle Joe Hayes, he took their horses and put them up. And they said their folks would be awful uneasy about them that night, but they couldn't go home if there's ever one of them did. And they couldn't even get them to go to bed. They laid right before the fire the whole night. They were scared so bad they wouldn't go to bed. And they said they'd never go back down in there again after dark if somebody give them a load of kettle. And uh, they never know what it was and what it meant, but they'd always said that there's something seen and heard there. Uh, I read at the bank of the creek where there's a row of hemlocks growing up along the bank of the creek. I've heard things that I never know what it was or what it meant. Well, I see one thing one time. Me and uh, and uh, two fellows was coming from church, and my daughter and another one of the girls was walking along in front of us, and they come a ball of fire down from up over the bank, right down right in front of them girls, and come right on down by me and these two fellows, and just when it got right against us, then it just went out, and. Uh, I never said nothing. It sort of raised her hair on my head. <laughs> and uh, I never mentioned it to them for a long time after that. Well, I asked the girls if they seen anything. They said they didn't. They never seen nothing. And I asked these fellows that was with me if they seen it. They said they did. But they never said nothing to me. Or I never said nothing to them. That's the only thing that I ever saw that I didn't know what it was. But I have heard things that I didn't know what it was and I never did know. Yeah. Well, I lived at one old house back over here, about, I guess it's two miles from where I live here, that they call the old Edie Green place. Me and my wife moved there just after we was married, and uh, lots of nights we'd hear something just like you'd drop a big rock or something that right down into the dining room, and I never knew what that was. And I'd be sitting there sometime before we'd go to bed and hear something like somebody walking on the porch. And I'd go up my door and there wouldn't be anything there. And uh, a preacher told me that he passed there one night and was in the stump a while with me, and I wasn't at home. And he said he heard something in the house just like everything was just tearing up and falling all the pieces in the house. Well, he said he got away from there. And it, they all claimed that the, people to hear things there. Mm. Now there's a fellow right up here I can tell you one that he saw right at that house. Or what's his name? Cornelius Watson. Well I have to go see him. Well he, he'll tell you about it now. He'll tell you just what he said. He's always told me that. And another fellow told me that one evening late between sundown and dark he seen it. A man looked like a moving down through the swamp. He wasn't walking, he was just off the ground, just a moving right along down the swamp. Ooh. And said when he went on down there, he, he come this here for a holiday and told him my way. He told he knowed him who he was, told him the way. Nobody answered and he just moved right on. It got to a fence, he just moved right through the fence, never crossed over nothing. And went right on down the swamp. And he said he never knew what went with it. Gosh. So that's some of them old ghost tales now that you heard about. Do you know any things, that, any sayings that's supposed to bring good or bad luck, you know, uh, like going under a ladder or something? Well, I've never heard about the ladder. 
but uh, they always tell me yeah, there's a little old uh, bee or something that comes in sometimes they call a news carrier. Yeah. You know, and it'll I've come heard. in your house and sit around and it'll go on a certain one. Now here it is for just a minute. And they say it hits a bringing bad luck to you. In that little news carrier. Well. And uh, it'll go to just one certain one. There's one in the house that'll go to every time. And then it's gone back out the door. Well, I, I'd hear the news piece, but I didn't know what they meant. Now, that's what they always claimed they meant. So, I remember that one of their, their shit, they had little twins, and they died, and they walked and carried them on their shoulder up on to the family cemetery. Mm -hmm. Like you could go up Hospital Hall and go up there to it, or you could go down across the railroad tracks and go up that way. Oh, so there's a cemetery up Hospital Hall? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Family cemetery. This was um, Phillips mm -hmm. Cemetery? Uh, my Gobble. great uh, granddaddy and mother and his wife were buried there. Mm -hmm. And one of Mama's sisters is buried there and one of Daddy's sisters is buried there. And then one of Daddy's cousins is buried there and his cousin's daddy is buried there, but his uh, wife is buried over Temple Hill and mm -hmm. two of their sons mm -hmm. because you had to take them in a hearse as far as you could go and then they'd have to load them over into a sled mm -hmm. and let an uh, animal pull it. Mm -hmm. And I can remember that out on the high road we called this out here, this lady passed away and the man come with the wagon, had two horses and took her. They didn't have a, a funeral home down in night, but one of the men that worked in the store down there would embalm them. Mm -hmm. And then they'd have to bring them back home, mm -hmm. which people don't do anymore. They leave them at the funeral home, which I think is much better. Do you? And Why is, do you think it's a little strange to bring them home? Mm -hmm. Because then, after you bring them home and you go to the funeral, there's that empty space, then it faces you as soon as you come in. Mm -hmm. And I think Bob always told me, he said, now, if I die in the morning and try to bury me that evening, I said, now, Bob, I'm not going to do that. That wouldn't be right. But he said he didn't want to be kept up and he didn't want to be brought home. Mm -hmm. But now they brought my mother and daddy both home. Back then it was, you know, yes. the, that's how people done. The they casket. brought them back home and then... Yeah. Well, would uh, they, and then would they put the casket in the living room? Yes, ma'am. Like up on the uh, they just, chairs uh, or... Sometimes they'd have to take uh, the scripts off the door, and I have known them to take the windows out to get a casket in. Mm -hmm because mm -hmm. maybe the doors was too narrow right. and they'd take the strips off and mm -hmm. then they'd put them in a corner or just set them like that and people come and sit up all night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know when my daddy died, he had worked with a colored man and he had saved his life. I don't know how that it had, he had managed. But then when daddy passed away, he come and knocked at the door and he asked my mother, if he could come in and look at my daddy. And my mother told him, yes, indeed, you're welcome to come in. And he said, well, he, he would never forget daddy because mm -hmm. he had saved his life. Maybe what I think was in the minds, probably. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was breaking sure. for my daddy or something. Right. Do you remember his name? Charlie Daniel. Uh-huh. So, and that was unusual, wasn't it, to have a black person yes, come to your mm -hmm. home? Yeah. Now, he asked to come in. He wouldn't come in. He took his hat off, mm -hmm. and he said, uh, "It would. Be, I would like to see him. Would it be all right if I come in?" And my mother said, "Yes, indeed. You're welcome to come in. Stay as long as you want to." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then my mother and daddy didn't have any uh, box over at the cemetery, but Bob had bought ten. So daddy told him, "Said, Bob, I'll buy two of your lots for me and mom, mm -hmm. and so they are buried over there." That's at Temple Hill? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. They're buried out here and Bob's buried on this end. Mm -hmm. And then I've got five more lots up here and two lots down there. There are a lot between Daddy and Bob for two people. I can either be buried by Daddy or I can be buried by Bob, but I want to be buried by Bob. Mm -hmm. And then whoever wants that other lot can use it. Right. 
But did you attend funerals at the old Phillips Cemetery mm -hmm. yourself? Up on the mountain. Up on the mountain. Yes, ma'am. Would it be quite a long hike up? Yes, ma'am. Wherever the yes, hearse could get. Yes, ma'am. And then they load them into a sled. Into the sled. And the horse pulled them pulled down. Up. And so then there'd be a long, part, big party of people that would yes, follow it up the Yes, ma'am. And people would already be gathered up at the cemetery that was expecting them. And I can remember when the, this road wasn't even hard topped, and this man with the, was Benny Edmonds. With the, he had a horse, and a, it was round like this, but the mouth was open that he, you know, picked up rocks on the road mm -hmm. when it wasn't even hard topped. Mm -hmm. Now, does somebody keep that cemetery up? Up on Hazel Mount, I mean up on the... Phillips? No, since uh, my mama's sister's boy always kept it up until he passed away. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody has been up there or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, most of the time, after the older folk are gone, the younger folk don't take an interest in these yeah. cemeteries and things like they should to take yeah. care of them. Mm -hmm. I have the feeling that there's lots of these family cemeteries yeah. all over these all mountains. All over Hazel Mountain. It's pitiful up there at the cemeteries they are. Three days passed and gone The evening shade of care Oh, may we all remember well the night of death draws near. We we'll lay our garments by, and on our beds we rest. So death will soon disrobe us all of what we hear possess. Lord, keep us safe this night, secure from all our cares. May ye angels guard us while we sleep, till morning light is here. And when we early rise, and you the young word son, may we press on to reach the prize, and after glory run, and when our days are past, and we from time remove, oh, may we yet Thy bosom rest, thy bosom of thy love. Can you guess this one? Crossed the bridge on Friday, stayed three days, and come back on the same Friday. Riding a horse named Friday. <laughs>